Hey there, my lovelies. Join me as I'm gonna to try to use these shells here, some sand and some creative sand drawings to explain a biological concept called the niche. Okay, let's give this a shot. Now, what we, I wanna to explain to you is that I'm gonna draw a circle in the sand. This circle right here in the sand represents all of the available places this living thing that we're gonna be working with can live and eat its food. That's critical. You have to understand that this location, this circle represents the place it can live and where it's getting its food. So let's go ahead and put some organisms in that circle. These are cone snail shells. They're all the same species and they're living in this circle and they're, and they're eating their food in this circle. This circle represents their niche. Now, there can be other niches over here, other circles over here, other circles over here. Those would be the niches of other organisms. So, this circle over here would be the niche of the cowrie shell, not the cone shells. So in this picture, in this diagram right here, the cone shells and the cowrie shells are living in a similar location, but have different niches represented by the two separate circles that are not overlapping. I'd like to talk to you about a concept in biology called competitive exclusion. Now, we're gonna use our understanding of niche. So let's go ahead and draw a niche circle here. This circle represents a location and all of its available resources. What we're gonna do now is we're going to put cowrie shells in that location, just like this. They're all spread out. Now, what this, what this diagram means is that inside of this location, the calorie shells are using all of these resources. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce cone shells. Now, cone shells are also in the exact same location. They're in the exact same um, niche. They're using the exact same resources as the calorie shells. Now this is a fundamental problem, and here's why. These two species, the calorie shells and the cone shells, are in direct competition with each other. That means when this calorie shell moves over here to eat, it's gonna run into this cone shell that's also trying to eat the same thing. And that is a bad, bad thing for these species. What's gonna happen is there's gonna be a battle, a war, and at the end of that war, both parties are going to be worse off because these cone shells are eating resources that the calories need and the calories are eating resources that the cone needs. Ultimately though, in biology, we believe that one of the species will prevail. Eventually, the calorie shells would outcompete all of the cone shells, rendering the cone shells extinct and the calorie shells left to have all of the resources to themselves, but they would have taken damage. And this is what we would have been left with, called competitive exclusion. Let's talk about something that's called the fundamental niche. It's an easy concept. The fundamental niche Let's draw our circle again. Remember, this circle represents 
the location and all of the resources that are in that location for an organism to utilize. Now, the fundamental niche, let's add some cone shells. These cone shells are now in this location and are utilizing the food that is there. Put these cone shells here. They're happy, they're reproducing, and they're living in this niche, this fundamental niche. And I'm gonna be, I gotta be crystal clear here. A fundamental niche is this location and all of the resources that are available. Meaning that it could be the algae that's, that they're using here. It could be the coralline algae that they're eating here. It could be all, any and all of the resources that are available here, these cone shells are utilizing. And they're not sharing with anybody. This is called the fundamental niche. It's the maximum area and resources that an individual species can occupy and use at any one given time without any influences or pressures from any other species. The fundamental niche is always going to be bigger than the realized niche. And we're gonna come back and show you what the realized niche is in just a second. Okay, in order to talk about the realized niche, we had to move locations. What I want you to focus on is notice the difference between the dry sand and the line where the wet sand starts. This is gonna be really important for explaining the realized niche. Let's draw our niche circle again. I'm gonna draw this circle, which represents all of the available resources within a given area and that area. But notice how these resources are somewhat split. There is the dry area and there is the wet area. So that could be like the red algae and the green algae, or it could be nuts in an area versus insects in an area for a food source, or it could be temperature changes where it's hotter here, but it's colder there. So it's some kind of subtle difference within the niche itself. Now, if we place the cone shells back into the niche, we can see that the cone shells can occupy both the, the wet area and the dry area. Oh no, I've lost the cone shell. Oh no, we're just gonna have to go without it. Now, this is their fundamental niche they are able to occupy the dry and the wet area because there's nothing that they're competing with. But then comes along the calorie. The calorie is now entering the niche. These two are in direct competition with each other. The calorie, however, is much better at being um, in the wet environment and can outcompete the cone shell because it's bigger. The calories push in and they push out the cone shells. The cone shells retreat to the drier area. Calories can't move into the drier area because it's too dry and they suffer there. So they stay in the wet area. And what we have now is a much smaller niche for the cone shells. This is called the realized niche. The cone shells have a new realized niche. Even though they could occupy this whole area if the calories wasn't, weren't there, since the calories moved in, the niche of the cone shells has gotten smaller and we call it the realized niche. Something to remember, the realized niche is always smaller than the fundamental niche. Another way we can represent the realized niche and the fundamental niche is through two curves on a graph. So watch as we draw this out. So if we take this line here and this line at the bottom of our graph represents all of the food in the area, this is food. And we take this line here and this is the number of species, right, in that area. We can show that a fundamental niche looks like this. It occupies 
All the, the, the number of individuals occupies all of the food. That would be us placing the cone shells and the cone shells occupying all of the usable space. This, all, this entire niche is occupied by cone shells. Now, what if calories move in? Well, if calories move in, this graph changes. Cone shells now spend more time over in this area eating this food, or, or um, you can look at it as the, the calories move in and they outcompete the cone shells for this type of food. Don't forget the one we lost. There it is. Now, we would have to rewrite this graph like this. There would be now two humps in the graph two bell-shaped curves representing the realized niche of the cone shells and the realized niche of the calorie shells. In some cases, realized niches aren't totally isolated from each other. In this case, we see an overlap of two realized niches right here. You see, the cone shells are good at getting resources here and so are the calories. So in this area, in this triangle between these two bell-shaped curves is a zone of competition. And even though the, the calories and the cone shells are, are competing, in, not the wave coming, are competing in this location, it's still not so much of a competition that it, it results in one of them going extinct. So in some cases, you can have a little bit of overlap. They can share a similar types of food. And this is what's going on with the Po'opa'a and the Kupipi. We caught them in the same location, the same niche location, but they are definitely separate niches with just a little bit of overlap. That's why we were able to catch them both. We were able to catch both of them with the same type of bait. We were using Kupipi. No, we were using Opihi. Dang it! It's this type of situation that's going on with the Kupipi and the Po'opa'a fish that we caught earlier. You see, the Kupipi and the Po'opa'a live in exactly the same location. So they're occupying the same niche, but are they? You see, the Po'opa'a has sharp teeth and lives in the rocks and is an opportunistic predator. It'll shoot out and grab stuff. It, it hunts in a different way. The, the Kupipi, on the other hand, is a grazer, a browser. It's constantly swimming around, looking for things to nip at on the rocks, and, and the dead giveaway are the teeth. Remember, in the Po'opa'a, the teeth are sharp, like daggers, and the Kupipi are like gnawing teeth. This shows that even though they ate the same bait, they took the same bait, they overlap here, and that they're opportunistic in eating the same opihi bait that we got, their, their niches are separate from each other. Because of their body type and the behavior that they express, they're not in direct competition with each other. If there were, one would go extinct and the other one would reign supreme. This is the same phenomena that we saw with the Kupipi and the Po'opa'a. Those two fish are living in the, oh no, no. My, my diagram got washed away by mother nature. <laughs>